Hello, I welcome you all to lesson three. In this lesson, we'll look at generally what are the principles surrounding deductible expenses. Remember in lesson two, we said that before arriving at the chargeable income of a person, there are some expenses that may be allowed to be deducted. Now, what are the general principles surrounding these expenses? What expense is allowed to be deducted from your accessible income before arriving at your chargeable income? And what expense may be disallowed in that determination? So today, at the end of the session, our objective is for you to be able to clearly understand the principles surrounding expenses being allowed for deduction or disallowed. So these are going to be the key topics to be covered. What are allowable expenses? What are disallowable expenses? How are repairs and improvement treated? And also finance costs. So these are the reading materials for you. Now, Businesses mainly, remember, persons may include businesses. And remember, we are looking at your income from employment, business, and investments. So when you have a business and you make gains and profits, in the course of these gains, making these gains and profits, there are obviously expenses that will be incurred. Now, how do we determine which of the expenses are allowed for tax purposes and which of the expenses are disallowed for tax purposes. Example, let's say I have a business and I make a profit of 100,000, but I have workers that I pay salaries of 30,000 in, in a year. Let's say my profit is 100,000 for the year, but I pay salaries of 30,000 within the year. Now, is it fair for me to be taxed on the whole 100,000? Meanwhile, I incur an expense of 30,000 to do what? To pay salaries? Should I be taxed on the difference of 70,000? Or I should be taxed on the whole 100,000? Now, the law or the act states clearly what will be allowed as an expense. The act states that once the expense was wholly, exclusively, and necessarily incurred in the production of the income, it should be allowed for deduction. So, the salaries that I paid my workers. The act is saying that was the salary necessary to be paid for me to get the income? If yes, then it should be up for what? For deduction. Was the salary paid exclusively for the purposes of generating the income? If yes, then again, it should be allowed for deduction. And finally, was the salary wholly incurred? the salary wholly incurred in the generation of the income or the workers were given the salary for some other jobs to be done also. If the salary you gave the workers or your employees were for them to wholly work on the production of the income that is about to be taxed, then that expense, according to the Act, which is Section 8 of our Act 896, that expense should be allowed to be deducted before we compute your tax liability. Now, generally, if the expense is of a capital nature, the act does not allow for that. Example, if I make a profit of 1 million Ghana cities for my business and I take 500,000 of it to purchase a new business premises, the law is saying that the new business premises you have purchased is of a capital nature and it was not wholly, exclusively, and necessarily incurred in the generation of the 1 million. And therefore, that 500,000 you used to purchase uh, the new premises will not be allowed as an expense. Because if you do so, then everybody would use portions of 
the profit generated to acquire a capital asset and then come to claim deduction so that they pay less tax. No, the expense that will be allowed are expenses that were necessary in the generation of the income. Was it necessary for you to have purchased the premises before getting the income of one million? No, because you purchased the equipment even after the generation of the one million. Even if you had bought the equipment or the premises within the year, was it necessary in the generation of the income? If not, then that cannot be granted as an expense. So normally, when you purchase assets that are of capital nature, it will not be granted to you as an allowable expense. Again, there are some formational expenses, which are some expenses you incur in the course of forming the business, which may be necessary in the formation of the business and exclusive to the business may be allowed for deduction. Now, let's look at this. In determining how much of the expense we should deduct, the law is clear and consistent with the accounting basis. So once the expense has been incurred, whether it is paid for or not, is deemed to be what? To be an expense that relates to the year and therefore it should be allowed example my workers are to be paid thirty thousand for the year but as at the end of the year i had paid them twenty thousand and i still owe them ten thousand because the ten thousand will definitely be paid to the workers the whole of the thirty thousand will be deducted as what expenses relating to Salaries we will not say that because I've paid only twenty thousand, only twenty thousand will be deducted from my assessable income. No, all amounts that were duly incurred during the year, whether they are paid for or not, because of the accrual concept, will be allowed for deduction if they so qualify. Now let's look at repairs and improvements. So remember we said that when you purchase let's say a building that will not be granted as what as an expense it will not be allowed as an expense to be deducted but what if i repair portions of the building or i improve upon the building now when you look at ies 16 which is the international accounting standards 16 it says that once the repair can be reliably estimated and the future economic benefit can flow to the business, it should be capitalized. That is what the provision of the of uh, IAS 16 says. But when you come to section 12 of the Income Tax Act, it says something different, which, which is not in the same direction as what IAS 16 is prescribing. So in our law, repairs and improvement are deductible whether they are of capital nature or not. So we don't really mind the nature of the repairs that you have engaged in or the improvement that you have done on the assets. But there are some general rules that would apply if you have to deduct an expense incurred on repairs and improvements the general rule is that one it should not exceed five percent of the written down value of the pool at the end of the year so you have to identify the pool within which the asset that has been improved fall under and then what is the written down value of that pool at the end of the year now the repair and improvements that you want to be deducted should not exceed five percent of the written down value of that pool again it could be granted in a first in first out manner so expenses that were incurred earlier repairs and improvement that were incurred earlier should be granted before the subsequent ones are granted now because of the five percent caveat or limits there may be excess repairs that will not be granted but you are allowed to add that to the basis for depreciating the asset so you add that back to so the subsequent depreciations will be based on that. Now, in determining 
or computing the repairs and improvements. Remember, we've stated clearly the position of the act. It states that it not be five, more than 5% of the written down value and the excess will be added to the depreciation basis. So let's look at a scenario and how it will be treated. So let's, we have this scenario. Food Limited incurred, so this is a, a company, they incurred expense of 2,500 on repairs and improvements of their plant and machinery. They have a plant, they improved upon it and it cost them two five. Now the profit that they declared for the year 2016 was 100,000. So within the year of assessment 2016, profit declared was 100,000. Now the written down value of the applicable pool before capitalizing was 60,000. So the pool within which the plant and machinery fall was at a written down value of what? Of 60,000. Remember what does the law say? The law says that we may not be able to grant all the two five provided the two five does not exceed five percent of what five percent of the written down value so let's look at it now how much profit has been made profit of hundred thousand has been made now what do you do we have repairs and improvement of what of two thousand five hundred now because the law does not straight away allow you to deduct repairs and improvements what we have to do is to add it back because you are not supposed to deduct repairs and improvements straight away so we have to add back remember this repairs has already been deducted before arriving at the hundred thousand profit when you prepare a profit statement if not for tax purposes you ordinarily would have deducted your repairs and improvements so for tax purposes you have to add it back so that the accessible income will increase to 102,500. That is the accessible income. Now that the law is saying that we will allow only 5% of the written down value. So we are now come to compute how much you are entitled to. So remember the written down value we are told that was 60,000. So what is 5% of 60,000? That is 3,000. Now, so this is what is 3,000. But remember, remember that the law says that you should not grant a deduction of repairs and improvement more than what? 5% of what? Of the written down value. So here we have 5% of the written down value being 3,000. So when you deduct that, you have what? 99,500. But remember, this is even more than the repairs and improvements that was actually incurred. Now you cannot be made to enjoy more than that. So that's why the law says that if it exceeds the 25, then the excess will have to be added to the depreciation base. So the one that will be granted actually will not be the 3,000, but rather the 2,5, because the 3,000 is in excess of the 2,5, and you cannot enjoy more than the expense that was actually incurred. So we have to use the 2,5 as the basis for the deduction, and the excess will be added to the depreciation base. Now let's look at illustration two. With illustration two, the expense was 6,000, the profit declared was 100,000 for the year. And the written down value was 60,000. So we go through the same process. Profit is 100,000. Let's add back the repairs and improvement because we have already deducted that from our profit, from our revenue before arriving at the profit. So we add back the 6,000 to get our 106. We do 5% of 60,000 and that gives us 3,000. Remember 3,000, is below the 6,000, so that will be granted. If it had been in excess, then the excess will be what? Will be added to the depreciation base, but because it's within 6,000, then that will be granted, and then the adjusted profit that will be taxed will now be 103,000. So we are not granting you 6,000 
deduction for a person improvement. Rather, it's only five per, five percent of the the written down value of sixty thousand that will be granted, which is the three thousand. So now the adjusted profit will be one zero three thousand and not hundred thousand. So you'll be taxed based on one zero three thousand and not the hundred thousand. Remember again what I said was that the company ordinarily would have deducted repairs and improvement before arriving at profits. So what you do first is to add back what they have done, which is the repairs and improvement of 6,000 to get 106. Then you come to what the law requires. The law requires that you are allowed only 5% of the written down value, which is now 3,000. So your 6,000 is not allowed. That's why we are adding it back. But the law will allow you 5% of the written down value, which is 3,000. So now your profit to be taxed or the adjusted profit is 103,000. Now let's look at research and development. Now this has become a key activity of businesses because you need to spend a lot of money annually in making your product better. So you research and you go into development that will help the product to work to meet the needs of the customers. Now the question is, how do you treat expenses incurred on such activities? Now section 30 of the Income Tax Act states that a research and development expense that is wholly, remember the three key conditions for expenses to be granted as deduction, is that they should be wholly, exclusively, and necessarily incurred in the generation. So the research that you did, if it was wholly, exclusively, and necessarily incurred in the generation of the income, then that should be allowed for deduction. So that's the key point. Was the research necessary? Was it uh, exclusively done for generation of the income? Or it was for something else? If it was done wholly, exclusively, and necessarily for the generation of the income, then that will be allowed as a deduction. So the act further states that an expense incurred by a person in the process of developing the business of that person. So the research may include even expenses you incurred in the process of developing, even when the business had not been fully formed. But all the research, the development that you had to go through in order to get a product. And also all the expenses you are incurred in improving the products or the processes, but it excludes any expense in care that is otherwise included in the cost of an asset used in the process. What it means is that you cannot add the same cost to another asset and then claim it separately as research and development. That will not be allowed. Now we come to what we call finance costs. Generally finance costs are the interest that you pay uh, when you borrow money and all, but there are other finance costs that you can set as premium that may uh, accrue on amortization over a long time and all of that. Now, the amount of finance costs other than interest, so means that in this case, interest is not part of it. So the other finance costs that businesses may engage in or may incur normally will be granted as what? As an allowable deduction, but there are some conditions. It should not, it should not exceed the sum of the financial gains that you made, that person made, and also 50% of the chargeable income for the year. So these are the two conditions. It should not be more than the financial gain plus 50% of the person's chargeable income for the year. So let's look at how to determine that. So let's look at this scenario. Now Money Bar Limited has the following trans had the following transactions for 2016. What was their profit before tax? It was 22,000. Uh, these were the expenses that they had catered for before arriving at their profit. They had already deducted depreciation. There was general bad debt that they had catered for. They have unrelieved loss, total financial gain, total financial cost, and all of these were the expenses they had catered for their the items they had catered for before arriving at their profits. Now we need to adjust the 
income of the business to arrive at the right income for the business how do we do that remember we said that to know the finance cost that will be allowed there are two conditions the first condition is that it should not be more than the financial gain and also that financial gain plus 50 percent of the chargeable income so it should not be more if you know the financial gain and also adjusted chargeable income and 50 percent of that plus the financial gain should exceed the financial cost that will be granted so let's look at it this was the net profit before tax 22,000. we need to add back these items remember we said general bad debt written off is not allowed so these are not specific in nature and we look at bad debt proper but note that when there's a general bad debt that you write it off it will not be granted as what well, as an expense deductible for the year so remember we are told that they did all of these before arriving at that now depreciation will also not be granted we'll look at capital allowance later and explain why depreciation is normally not granted for purposes of determining the uh the chargeable income of a business so what you do is that you add back the general bad debt written off add back the depreciation so that the profit will go up because these two items shouldn't have been deducted in the first place so we're adding them back to get thirty thousand five hundred. now the unrelieved loss should be what should be deducted from what from the thirty thousand, and also capital allowance will rather be granted in place of depreciation so capital allowance is normally allowed for you to deduct and we'll look at capital allowance later in the session and that gives us the chargeable income for the year now what we are interested in is the issue of the finance costs and the finance gain now remember that the business has already deducted the certain finance cost which we are saying that that finance cost will not be allowed but the one to be allowed is based on a certain criteria so what you do first is that the finance cost that they have already deducted you add it back so they had already deducted a finance cost of uh, fifty thousand. so what do we do we say this is not to be allowed so what do we do we have to add it back to get what 66 500 and then you also less the financial gain because the chargeable income that we have to take 50 percent of should not include the the, the loss here it should not include the financial loss or financial gain so you have to we have already added the financial gain so we have to deduct it so that our chargeable income adjusted will not include the financial gain and the financial cost because that is what the law requires now let's look at what will be allowed as a financial cost like i said we said the financial cost should not exceed should not exceed the financial gain plus 50 percent of the adjustable chargeable income and we have the adjustable chargeable income as 59 500 so what is the financial gain you come here you realize that our financial gain was what was seven thousand so that is here the financial gain is seven thousand and then we come to the 50 percent of the adjusted chargeable income of 59 500 so you compute 50 percent of the adjusted chargeable income it gives us 29 750 so it means that the finance cost that will be allowed under the act is 36 750 and not what they have computed as 50,000 this 50,000 will not be allowed rather the finance cost that will be allowed is 36 750 so the amount 36 750 represent the allowable finance cost for the year so the excess remember they deducted 50,000 the excess of 13 250 which is disallowed can be allowed to be carried forward to the next five years so you can carry it forward and then be deducting for the next five years until the 13 250 is fully accounted for but in the current year you only be allowed to deduct 
the financial gain plus 50% of the adjusted uh, chargeable income. So when you look at this proper, it means that uh, the 22,000 will be there, depreciation will be deducted as usual, the general bar debt will be deducted, the will be added back, sorry, depreciation will be added back because we had already deducted, which shouldn't have been deducted. So we add back the depreciation, we add back the general bar debt. It's only specific bar debt that are de deductible. We will look at that later. So we add it back. Now the final cost, 50,000 that we had deducted, should be added back because that is not what you are supposed to deduct. So all these things are going to be added back and we get what? 8,500. Then the unrelieved loss of 2,000 will be deducted. And then now the allowable financial cost, which we computed as 36,750, will now be allowed for deduction. So the right adjusted profit will now be 41,750. That will be the adjusted profit on which your tax will be what? Will most likely be computed. So once you have the adjusted profit, you now take out the capital allowance of 12,000, you get a chargeable income, and then you compute your tax of 25% on that. Now in this text, the key issue is with the finance gain and finance cost. And the first thing we are saying is that the finance gain, we are told that they have already deducted it. That is fine, you are supposed to deduct it. The finance cost that they have deducted rather shouldn't have been deducted because the law says that your finance cost should only be the finance gain plus what? Plus 50% of the chargeable income or the adjustable chargeable income. So your total finance gain, yes, it's a gain. So it's added to your income to determine uh, your total chargeable income, right? By the finance cost, we have to recompute it. And in recomputing it, we needed to exclude the finance gain and the finance cost that you have included already. So that is why you see the finance cost, which we had already deducted, being added back. And then the finance gain, which we had already added as an income, being deducted so that the adjusted profit will not have either the gain or the cost. So this will more or less be net of the gain and the cost, right? So it does not include that. Then the finance cost to be allowed will only be the finance gain plus 50% of your adjusted chargeable income, which is 36,750. So once you now know the finance cost that is allowed, you then go on to the statement and then now you will be allowed to deduct 36,750. So you have to add back the 50,000 to your profits because that one you have already deducted, which was not supposed to be deducted. So now the one that the act allows is 36,750. So you can now less that one and you get your adjusted profits. Remember the gain? Yes, you've made it. So you're not going to less the gain because the gain is allowed, it's in the profits. Right, but the issue is with the cost, the finance cost. How do we know the right finance cost to have been deducted? Okay, so we do that and then we have a chargeable income. Okay, now let's look at bad debt. Now, earlier I mentioned, but when you talk about bad debt, you are referring to debt that clearly you have taken all the reasonable steps, but it's not possible for you to be able to retrieve those debts. So let's say the person is dead, the person has gone mad, and the person is owing you. Now this is a loss to the business. Now how do I pay tax on goods that I've sold to someone and the person is not in a position to pay because the person is there, the person is mad, or some other factors that will make it difficult for me to retrieve it. So such debts which has gone bad are allowed to be deducted, but there are some conditions. One, the amount ought to be included in the receipt and accrued. So it means that you should have 
show something to this person and that should have been included in your revenue in the first place and in the second place the claim that you want to make as bad should be based on advances you made to the person in the normal course of your business so i saw phones the person came to buy phone. it shouldn't be that the person came to buy something else rather than what your core business is so take note of that the next one there should be evidence to show that you've taken all the reasonable steps to retrieve this money but it's not possible for you to get it and then there should be an evidence that you had made a specific provision for this debt okay now rent rent as an expense again if i have a business and i've rented a place for the business and i pay in a year thousand cities it's fair that that thousand cities be deducted before i am made to pay tax because that is an expense that is wholly exclusively and necessarily incurred in the generation of the income however if the land or premise is also used for a private purpose then portions of the rent costs will be disallowed because if you've rented a whole apartment and you're using only two rooms of the say the five rooms for the office space you cannot claim a deduction for the whole uh facility because you are not using the whole facility for the business so the portion that is used for private purposes will be disallowed by the tax authorities so in summary what you are saying is that in determining the chargeable income of a business the first thing you do is that determine the accessible income right you determine the accessible income now once you have the accessible income you need to find out what expense is allowed to be deducted before we get the taxable profit or the chargeable profit now some of the expense are disallowed others are allowed now the conditions for allowing or disallowing the expenses we've already explained we said that mainly the expense should be necessarily wholly and exclusively incurred in the production of the income if the expense was incurred outside the remit of the production of the income then it cannot be granted as a deduction uh, for the income so generated so this lesson or session allows us to appreciate how finally we determine the chargeable income of what of a business and know what expense will be allowed what expense will be disallowed to know actually what is the income that has been generated for purposes of what taxation see you in the next session so these are quizzes that you have to go through make sure you're able to attempt these uh, questions fairly go through them and then try and attempt these questions all right see you in the next class